welcome, dear friends, to this little Advent retreat, Stations of the Infancy. And I'm here again in the little patio garden in St. Clement's, which is part of Redemptor's publications. And our maestro Alessandro, as usual, is behind the camera. Um, St. Alphonsus Liguori is famous for his Stations of the Cross, but he also wrote Stations of the Infant Jesus, which is much lesser known. He has wonderful stations entitled Jesus is Suckled, Jesus with his hands free from swaddling clothes, Jesus begins to walk, Jesus sleeps. Now, I don't have my founder Alphonsus's enormous sympathetic imagination to enter into the unknowable moments of Jesus' childhood. So I have stuck to more familiar territory in choosing stations from uh, the Gospels. Now, in the book Stations of the Infancy, I've chosen 14 stations. But for this Advent, I thought it would be easier to have 12 Stations of the Cross so that for each week of the four weeks in Advent, we have three stations each. Now, they're not long, dear friends. Each station will be under 10 minutes, so we won't keep you too long. The first station I've named, the word becomes flesh. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From John's prologue, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things came to be. Not one thing had its being but through him. All that came to be had life in him, and that life was the light of all peoples, a light that shines in the dark, a light that darkness cannot overpower. The picture I have chosen to go with this station is a, a famous picture from outer space of the earth with the sun just touching the perimeter, the reflection. When the evangelist John celebrates the beginning of the Jesus story, he goes back before time, before history, before creation. The Jesus story in John's Gospel begins not with the adult Jesus by the River Jordan in Mark, a newborn baby, in Joseph's home in Bethlehem, Matthew, or a newborn lying in a borrowed manger in Bethlehem, Luke, but before the creation of the world. John's Messiah does not come from Bethlehem, but from outside the realm of creation. Neither can he be accurately identified as Jesus of Nazareth, because he does not come from there, but from the upper realm. For John, the details of Jesus' earthly beginning are irrelevant. No birth story is told, no mother is introduced, no time is recorded, no place is noted, no witnesses are named, because his true origin is beyond the cosmos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John goes back beyond the prophetic story of Israel in Mark, who starts with Isaiah, and the Jewish story in Matthew. He starts it, remember, with Abraham, and the human story in Luke, where Luke takes the genealogy of Jesus back to Adam. John goes back way, way beyond those beginnings to rework Genesis and anchor the beginning of the Jesus story in the originality of God. 
independently of the earlier three Gospels, John moves out of any historical frame and offers eternity as the real setting for the Jesus story. There is a sense in which John breaks free of any controls or limitations to the Jesus story, and he passes effortlessly beyond all earthly and historical barriers to root the Jesus story in the eternity of God. John provides a unique interpretative background against which everything he says about Jesus must be read in the light of the opening verse. You say, well, that's Jesus' origins. Well, what about our origins? Remember the opening of the letter to the Ephesians. Our true origins are celebrated before creation. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all the spiritual blessings of heaven and Christ, before the world was made, he chose us, chose us in Christ to be holy and spotless and to live through love in his presence. And I will conclude, dear friends, with a prayer. Most merciful God, you so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish, but enjoy everlasting life. Increase our faith, we pray, so that rooted and grounded in the mystery of the Word made flesh, we may forever attach ourselves to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. We ask this through the merits of the same Christ who lives and reigns in the unity of the Holy Spirit, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, dear friends, to this second station, the Annunciation to Zechariah, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From Luke's Gospel, Zechariah, do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth is to bear a son, and you must name him. John. The painting I have chosen, dear friends, for this station is uh, Domenico Ghirlandaio, The Annunciation to Zechariah. This fresco is a series Ghirlandaio made for the Tunabuoni family in the church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. He turned the Jewish temple into a typical Renaissance church. We see the priest Zechariah interrupted while he's dutifully incensing the altar of sacrifice. The angel comes to announce the coming birth of his son John. The painter illustrates lavishly Luke's line, the whole congregation was outside in this case, members of the Florence government and the Tournabuoni family. Reflection To understand the beginning of the story of the adult Jesus, the four Gospels point us to someone else, the figure of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the independent prophetic force that stands between the hidden life of Jesus and his public ministry. Jesus does not begin alone. None of us do. 
Jesus, like many other people, is attracted by the person and preaching of John the Baptist. Like many of his contemporaries, he submits to John's baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. After his association with John, Jesus' life takes a dramatic turn. He follows John in the prophetic vocation and reinterprets the message of his mentor. There's a firm anchor point in the Gospels. If you're going to tell the story of Jesus, you have to tell the story of John the Baptist. This is underlined in the infancy narrative of Luke's Gospel. Before the evangelist introduces us to the parents of Jesus, telling us of the enunciation of the birth of Jesus, his birth and circumcision, he first introduces the parents of John the Baptist, telling of the enunciation of the birth of John, his birth and circumcision. The tradition is firm. Jesus comes after John. The angel Gabriel tells Zechariah of the joy and gladness which the birth of John will bring to many, not just his parents, and outlines the future career for John. John will lead a movement of conversion to God and prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. His mission is clear, to prepare for the Lord a people fit for him. In Luke's understanding, John the Baptist is the last prophet of the Old Testament. Up to the time of John, it was the law and the prophets. Since then, the kingdom of God has been preached. The child who is born of ancient parents will close the Old Testament. Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, will open the New Testament. In these two figures, the unity of the whole biblical story is told. Let us pray. Almighty God, who sent your servant John the Baptist to be a herald for the coming kingdom and to prepare a way for your beloved son, we pray that you might continue to call men and women from every race and nation to be like John the Baptist, a witness to speak for the light, so that people might believe in him through the integrity of their life and the power of their example. This we pray in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, welcome to this, the third station of our Stations of the Infancy. And this station is entitled, The Annunciation to Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rejoice, so highly favoured, the Lord is with you. Mary replied, let what you have said be done in me. The painting I've chosen to go with this station is Virgin Annunciat by Antonello da Messina, painted about the middle of the 15th century. In paintings of the Annunciation, you usually see the angel Gabriel visiting Mary with God's message. Antonella focuses on Mary alone as she is interrupted during her reading. She is neither crowned nor does she have a halo. She's a young woman of Nazareth. In this painting, we, not Gabriel, are the viewer. 
Each of us is invited to look at Mary without Gabriel and without the distraction of a background as she graciously responds to God's word. Reflection. Mary gives the classic response of the disciple when challenged by the word of God, let what you have said be done in me. That is her annunciation, her consent to hand over her body and spirit to God's purpose. The love that offers itself is the love that must wait. That is why there are two annunciations, God's annunciation to Mary and Mary's annunciation to God. God's best plans can only happen when there is human cooperation when God's word and our word come together. When those two annunciations come together, God's word always becomes flesh. Mary, like all mothers, gives over her body and mind and soul so that a new life might be born. She does this so that a life larger than hers may take its place in the world. All mothers must wait for the gradual process of what is happening within them. They must learn to let go of the child within them. They must not only nurture the presence of the child within them, they must nurture the leaving of the child. The act of childbirth is a painful act of letting go so that the life within can take its own separate place in the world. Mary's vocation is not only to hold Jesus within her, but to let him go. Let him become the person that he must become. Whatever Mary was planning for her life with Joseph, it did not include becoming pregnant outside that relationship. An unexpected word interrupts the routine of life and proposes a groundbreaking diversion from what is planned. Nothing less than a startling new future is proposed. Mary gives up her own wishes in order to adopt God's desire. She gives up personal control of her life in favor of God's promise. In her response, she pledges her body and spirit to the purposes of God. Mary assists the struggle of God to become one like us. There's something dangerously new about Mary. She is the woman at the center of the Christian story. It's a woman, not a man, who brings the real presence of Christ into the world. Through her, the presence of the Christos Kyrios will be known and celebrated. Let us pray. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, O Mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.